Okay, well, good evening and welcome to the public meeting for the draft removal action work plan for the Carquinez Middle School Modernization Project. Uh, my name is Asha Setti and I'm a public participation specialist with the California Department of Toxic Substances Control. Thank you so much for joining us this evening. Uh, we do hope that you're all staying safe and staying well during the pandemic. We'll have a short presentation followed by uh, plenty of time for public input. Uh, I'll be facilitating the public comment portion of this meeting and encourage you to provide us with feedback. Uh, this meeting is being recorded. Uh, you've all entered on mute. Um, if you'd like to turn your video on, just click on the camera icon at the bottom of the screen to start or stop your video. Um, and now let me introduce you to my colleague, Jerry Dietrich, who will provide us with tech support if needed. Uh, can you say hi, Jerry? Hi, everyone. Good evening. And she'll help keep us muted so we avoid background noise for the recording. Um, in case we do encounter any technical difficulties, uh, let's try and have patience with each other. Uh, we're all still learning, and if you're unfamiliar with online meetings, we'll do our best to assist you. Um, slide two, please. And next, I'll go over how to participate in the Zoom meeting. Uh, we would appreciate it if you could hold your questions until the end of the presentation. Uh, there's two ways you can participate. You can click the raise hand icon at the bottom of the screen and unmute yourself when we call on you. Uh, or you can click on the chat icon and type your question or comment uh, if you prefer to have it read out loud. Um, for anyone calling in, uh, there is a way to raise your hand and unmute yourself. And that's by dialing star nine to raise your hand. And then to unmute yourself, you'll have to dial star six. Um, if you have a quick clarifying question that you'd like us to respond to during the presentation, uh, you can use the chat feature. If it requires a more in-depth response, uh, we may hold it to the end, so please bear with us. Um, and if anyone is in need of live transcription, please let us know and uh, we can turn that feature on. Uh, slide three, please. And now I'd like to introduce you to the other DTSC staff that will be presenting as part of today's meeting. Uh, first, we have Liz Tisdale, who's the project manager for the site. Can you say hi, Liz? Good evening. And next, we have Jose Salcido, who's the chief of DTSC schools unit. Right, can you say hi, Jose? Good evening, everyone. Thank you. Uh, slide four, please. Uh, next, I'll go over the agenda. Uh, Jose will provide an overview of DTSC's mission and the school's program. And then Liz will go over the site background, the proposed cleanup plan, and next steps. Uh, then we'll have time for public input, and we'll open it up to questions and comments. Um, in addition to Liz and Jose, uh, I should also mention we do have a risk assessor named Mai No, who's also available to take questions during the public input this evening. Um, that's it for opening announcements, and now I'll turn it over to Jose. Thank you, Asha. Uh, good, evening, good evening, everyone, and welcome to the Cartinas Middle School uh, <clears throat> Removal Action or RAW presentation. My name is Jose Salcedo. I'm a supervisor of the Northern California Schools Unit. I will briefly discuss DTSC's mission and the school's evaluation process. So DTSC's mission is to protect its residents from exposure to toxic chemicals. Uh, next slide, please. Uh, it should be on slide six. In particular, uh, the school's unit ensures that schools are built or rebuilt as is the case uh, for the Cortinas Middle School on safe grounds to protect students, teachers, and staff. Next slide, please. Okay, uh, should be on slide seven now. So uh, school site projects that are subject to DTSC school process are those that are seeking uh, matching state funds. Now, the process is composed of three steps. Schools can, uh, schools can be deemed clean at each of these steps. Step one is an assessment of the history of the property. Uh, are there any man-made or naturally occurring substances on the site? Uh, this is done through a phase one environmental site assessment. If that assessment indicates there are not any environmental hazards at the property, then the site can be closed at this point 
and DTSC can issue a no action determination letter. However, if the assessment indicates that there could be some environmental conditions that need to be investigated and tested, uh, step two is required. At this point, uh, the investigation or the site is investigated by collecting environmental samples and sending those uh, for laboratory analysis. And this work is done through a preliminary endangerment assessment from up or preliminary environmental assessment, also known as a PEA. If the PEA determines that the results of the sampling do not pose a threat, that the school can be closed at, um, with a no further action determination letter from the TSC. However, if the PEA determines that uh, additional actions are needed, then uh, uh, because there are, any, uh, there are potential threats, then step three is necessary. Step three is cleanup. Uh, this is where the Cartinas Middle School project is currently at and cleanups are conducted through removal action work plans or ROS. Uh, once the ROS are implemented, uh, the raw activities are summarized and documented in a removal action completion report. Uh, we call those racers. Uh, and uh, after DTSC reviews uh, and approves the racer, then DTSC uh, issues a site certification letter. Uh, next slide, please should be slide eight. Uh, DTSC schools program came into existence in January of 2000. Here's a summary of uh, how many schools <clears throat> sites have been cleared to date. We have 726 schools that have been cleared through a phase one no action determination. We have 1,079 projects that have been cleared through, uh, uh, PEA, uh, <clears throat> through a PEA no further action determination and 276 through raw certifications. Uh, that's a total of uh, uh, over uh, almost 2,100 uh, school projects that have been cleared through DTSC. After this cleanup is, uh, <clears throat> is completed, we'll be adding to that total. Uh, I'll turn over the presentation now to Liz, who's gonna take on the, uh, the technical presentation. Thank you, Jose. Uh, I'm Liz Tisdale, and I'm the project manager for this site. Next slide, please. Here we have in slide nine an aerial photograph of the Carquinez Middle School and surrounding area of Crockett. And just to the north of Carquinez Middle School is one of the schools Jose talked about. Um, John Sweat High School was uh, DTSC oversaw an investigation and cleanup there uh, for lead from lead-based paints and volatile organic compounds from a gas station leak. Uh, DTSC conducted that investigation and cleanup in 2011 and certified that the site was clean in 2015 after construction was complete or after the new construction was complete. Next slide, please. Uh, here we have a site location map that's zoomed in on the Carquinez Middle School campus. As you can see, it's bordered to the north by Pomona Street, to the east by Crockett Boulevard, and to the west by residences. We are aware that this is a residential area, and we will go into further detail later in this presentation about our uh, health and safety program and our dust protocol measures to ensure that dust does not migrate out of our work areas. Uh, to give some history on the site, its main school building was constructed in 1923 when this campus was uh, developed into a middle school. And then this smaller structure to the southeast of the main school building uh, was the former band building that was constructed circa 1958 and was demolished in 2020 as part of the school redevelopment process. Now a lot of the school is currently under construction and it sounds like a good chunk of the new building is in place. Uh, DTSC's involvement for this project will be restricted to the area behind this former band building where we found areas with elevated lead concentrations in soil and a small area to the northeast of the northwest of the main school building where we also found um, a smaller area of elevated lead concentrations in soil. These buildings are from 1923 and 1958. Those are within the time period when lead-based paint was commonly applied to structures. Um, so this isn't yeah, it was commonly applied to structures during that time. And next slide, please. And then this is just in print, the, the history we just went over. Uh, next slide, please. Here, 
On slide 12, we have a summary of previous investigations at the site. In 2017, the district conducted a limited lead survey to investigate painted surfaces for lead-based paint on both the interior and exterior of buildings. Um, in 2019, the district conducted a limited phase one environmental site assessment. This was to investigate for lead in lead-based or lead in soil surrounding the buildings from lead-based paint, pesticides from um, construction, and polychlorinated biphenols from window caulking and transformers in soil surrounding buildings. And this found lead in soil. We did not find PCBs or pesticides at levels that would necessitate a cleanup. Later in 2019, uh, the district entered into an environmental oversight agreement with the Department of Toxic Substances Control, and we conducted a preliminary environmental assessment for our oversight. Uh, this further investigated lead in soil and investigated the site for volatile organic compounds from the former gas station. We did not find VOCs or at levels that would prevent, present a hazard. And then in 2020, we conducted a supplemental site investigation to further define that lead contamination. Next slide, please. Here on slide 13, we have a zoomed out view of the phase one sample locations from the district sampling. Um, as you can see, there are dots around the main school building and around the band building. And then we also took samples out in the field area to get kind of an ambient level. Neither of these exceeded our screening criteria. Next slide, please. Here on slide 14, we have a zoomed in view of the main school building with lead sampling results. Um, all of these results were under our screening criteria, which is 80 milligrams per kilogram, except for B9 up here in the northwest corner. That one did exceed our screening criteria in the shallow soil. Next slide, please. And here we have the phase one sampling results from the band building. Um, None of the samples on the paved side of the building exceeded our screening criteria or our cleanup criteria. Only the two samples on the back side of the building that it said currently dirt um, exceeded our cleanup goals. Next slide, please. And to further assess that during the preliminary environmental assessment, uh, we took two samples up here in the northwest corner for soil vapor, as that is the closest area of the site to the former gas station, and we did not find VOCs at concentrations that were higher than our cleanup goals. Uh, here we took it step out samples around in this planter box area from where we found the exceeded lead, or from where that sample exceeded in the phase one sampling, and then we did the same thing here behind the band building. We took multiple samples throughout this area to try to characterize the extent of that lead. And then down here is the transformer samples. Um, we did not find PCBs from those. Those are the primary, or those are the chemical of concern from transformers. Next slide, please. So this brings us to our proposed cleanup areas and the areas of the site that DTSC will have oversight of when we begin this process, when we begin our cleanup. This area to the east of the former band structure is approximately 95 cubic yards of soil. And then this area to the north of the main school building is approximately five cubic yards of soil. In total, we're looking at approximately 100 cubic yards of soil or about six truckloads of contaminated soil here. Next slide, please. So what do we do about this? Well, the RAW presents four cleanup al or four remediation alternatives or cleanup alternatives um, that we consider. Um, and then it recommends the one that seems the most effective for the site. In this case, the first one we considered was the no action alternative. We're required to um, evaluate this alternative to get a baseline for what happens if we do nothing. Um, in this case, that does not meet it's not protective because it leaves that soil in place and could create a potential exposure and it doesn't meet the project objectives. In this case, those objectives are to minimize exposure, remove contamination and source soil for the source of the contamination and minimize any potential for that to migrate elsewhere. Uh, the second alternative presented in the raw is capping with deed restrictions. While well, this is protective because it would create a layer of clean soil between and a barrier between uh, potential exposure to the contaminated soil. It's not really, it doesn't meet the project objectives because it doesn't remove that source material. It's impractical for the intended use of that site because the area where the lead contamination is, is intended to be the play yard or the play areas for the new school. So it's not really practical to have a dirt cap in an area that's very high traffic like that. The third alternative presented in the raw is treatment. 
This is not very protective and it doesn't meet our objectives as it's extremely time consuming and not as effective as capping or dig and haul would be for removing that risk. And then the fourth alternative we considered was dig and haul, or the fourth alternative presented in the raw is dig and haul, and that is the one it recommends. Uh, next slide, please. So the raw proposes alternative four. This is the most protective as it permanently removes the contaminated soil from the site. For this alternative, we would be digging up that contaminated soil, loading it into covered bins, and then having it removed. Once we receive confirmation sampling from the excavated areas that that soil had been removed, the areas would then be backfilled with clean soil, and then that would be the end of any potential exposure to that soil. Uh, next slide, please. So what should you expect when we, if we're going to begin this work? Uh, the cool, uh, to begin with, fencing would be installed around the work zones and site perimeter, and then dust screens will be fitted to those uh, fences to ensure as an extra layer of protection from any dust potentially traveling off site or out of the work zones. We'll also have water trucks on site and contaminated soil and air work areas will be wetted prior to any digging and then during excavation. And then all soil will be wet loaded into those bins. Uh, if you're unfamiliar with wet loading, it's where the soil is wetted down prior to any excavation or disturbance. At, as the excavator is excavating it into its, into its bucket, it will continue to be wetted. It'll be wetted the entire time it is transported to the bin and wetted as it is dumped into the bin. And then um, the soil in the bin is also wetted down to ensure that there's no potential hazard. Uh, next slide, please. And if you're unfamiliar, um, there's a picture on the right that shows a green screen on the fence. That's the dust screen. It's uh, much better at preventing dust from traveling off site than just the Zeppelin fence would be. And then this item on a, this little box on the tripod is a dust monitor. Dust monitoring will be occurring continuously at all times in the work areas and along the fence lines whenever we are digging. And then if you're unfamiliar with these, this is the covered roll-off bin we are proposing for soils or the raw proposes for soil storage. This is a very, this is the best way you could possibly store soil on the site. It doesn't have any plastic sheeting involved. Nothing can come out of it or anything like that. Um, this bin will be open, of course, when we're loading it, but as we said, it'll be wet loaded. So it'll be, dust will not be coming out of this bin. And then anytime it is not in use, it will be shut and sealed with the clamps down. And next slide, please. So, Work notices, work notice prior to this work beginning, um, you'll receive a work notice in your mailbox at least five days prior to that work beginning. And then this will be very similar to the notice we sent out in June of 2020 for our supplemental site investigation work. And that'll have the map, work hours, excavation areas, everything you could, you would wanna know about what's going to be happening at the site. And it'll also have who to contact and their contact information with any concerns or questions you may have about the cleanup as it's occurring. Slide, please. So, for the California Environmental Quality Act or CEQA, DTSC is a responsible agency under CEQA, and as such, we have prepared an addendum to the district's initial study mitigated negative declaration or ISMND, and that was to include any environmental impacts that may result from our cleanup activities into a CEQA document. Once DTSC is ready to approve the RAW, we will prepare and file a notice of determination. Next slide, please. So schedule for the project, uh, currently public comment period ends May 5th. After the proposal of the public comment period, DTSC will receive, respond to any public com any comments received. Um, once we have responded to those, if a modification to the RAW is necessary, we will make it at that time. After that, we will finalize the RAW. When we implement it, that implementation will take approximately two weeks and then once cleanup is complete, DTSC can certify the site. This will occur after excavation is complete. We have completed um, characterization. We've completed all confirmation sampling to ensure that all contaminated soil has been removed from the site. And then that soil will also need to undergo waste profiling to in decide where, uh, which, where, which landfill it will be disposed of at. And I will turn it back over to Asha to go over the public comment process and how to submit them. Thank you. Thanks so much for the presentation, Liz. 
Uh, next slide. Please. Oh, there we go. Okay, thanks, Jerry. Um, we're going to go over to the uh, public comment process next. The public comment period started March 22nd and ends on Wednesday, May 5th. Uh, for comments that we receive after tonight's meeting, we'll acknowledge that we've received your comment. Uh, please do bear with us until after the close of the comment period to receive a written response. Uh, we will send responses to everyone who provides us with contact information and also include that in the local information repository. Uh, those comments will be combined in a separate response to comments document that becomes a part of the final removal action work plan. Uh, next slide, please. Well, there's several ways you can submit comments to us. Um, the first is at tonight's meeting. After the meeting, you can contact Liz directly by email, phone, or mail to submit your comments. Um, this information is included here, as well as on the community update that was mailed to you. Next slide, please. Now, because the local library was not open due to the pandemic, uh, we made arrangements with the John Sweat, <clears throat> excuse me, Unified School District to make sure uh, hard copies available of the draft cleanup plan available for review. Um, if you'd like to access a hard copy, you can visit the district's office in Rodeo Monday through Friday. Their office is open by appointment only from 7.30 to 4. Uh, please contact the superintendent to make arrangements. You can also access documents for Cartina's Middle School online, um, including this presentation on our Embarrassed database. Um, so please don't hesitate to reach out if you need assistance and I can walk you through it or send you direct links. Next slide, please. Um, here's contact information uh, for both Liz and I. Um, please feel free to get in touch with us anytime. If you have questions about the school modernization plans, uh, please contact the superintendent of the school district, Charles Miller. Um, all this information is also in the community update that was mailed out. And that takes us to the end of our presentation. Um, and so now I'd like to open it up for questions or comments. Um, just a reminder, you have two ways to participate. Uh, you can either click on the raise hand icon or use the chat feature. Um, I do see that uh, we have um, some chats that came in. So let's see what we have here. Um, first, um, I know that Nancy has to leave. Are you still with us, Nancy? Um, would you like to um, state your concerns to us um, or would you like me to read it out from the chat? Okay, I'll go ahead. Well, I, I, I can, okay, I, I here can, you uh, are. Me, Hi, Nancy. Read Welcome. I can, I can read it. Um, <clears throat> in that the surrounding neighborhood was exposed to aerosolized lead back in March 2020, when the contaminated soil was excavated with a steam shovel and hauled away in an open air truck with no mitigation procedures in place, we were asking for the uh, DTSC to pay for uh, serum testing, blood serum testing for the community. Who would like to respond to that? Um, Jose or Mai, would you like to respond to Nancy's concerns? Um, I'm trying to, I was trying to unmute. I'm sorry. This is Mai from DTSC. So um, I'm not sure what kind of activity or what activity you're referring to. Um, can somebody confirm that that um, was something that happened? I mean, there was excavation of some kind? Liz? Yes, Nancy shared with us um, pictures and this was work that was done um, by the school district. And Nancy, let me know if I'm getting this right. This is the pictures that you shared with us of the um, of the rubble and some soil material um, last year. Um, during Not the showing on my screen, but I, I, I trust that. Um, yes, I, okay. I did submit those uh, those pictures. Correct. Yes. Um, so that work um, that Nancy's referring to um, was not done with our oversight, um, and so this is. <laughs> work that was conducted by the school district is my understanding. Um, and then maybe Liz, you can chime in here. Um, 
I... So this was from the band building demolition. Um, the dirt that was visible at the top of that dumpster was from underneath the building foundation when DTSC went out there to conduct the supplemental site investigation of June in June of 2020. The contaminated area that we'd identified during the PEA or preliminary environmental assessment had not been disturbed by the district. Um, we did not have oversight over their ability to demolish that building. And why did they then cover it with plastic, hold down the plastic with uh, bricks and a folding chair? We can't speak to the folding chair. Um, the reason the soil was covered was because um, the community had brought the concern that that soil was sitting uncovered and we DTSE requested that the district cover that soil. I guess that is what the construction crew had on site at the time to cover it with. Hmm. We still want um, DTSC to pay for serum blood testing uh, for the people who live and work uh, around the neighborhood. My, maybe you could talk about um, exposure to lead um, to kind of better kind of frame Nancy's question there. Well, um, it sounds like lead contaminated soil was not um, disturbed at that time, but if um, if lead contaminated soils were um, excavated, uh, we typically have um, perimeter air monitoring to make sure that um, all the you know the, the dust um, levels are below or at the um, ambient air quality standards. But um, Generally, for, at this site, the um, the lead contamination comes from um, lead paint, and generally that has those <laughs> particles or those are flecks and um, pieces that are basically are too big to. I mean, they don't aerosolize, and um, the particulates they wouldn't remain in the um, they wouldn't remain airborne, basically. That's not our understanding. We've talked to geologists that have a completely different um, opinion than that. And um, unfortunately, I have to leave. I have another board meeting to attend to, but um, our request still stands. Thank you. Thanks for okay. attending, Nancy. I did want to. I did want to mention, Nancy, that I understand that um, CDPH does provide the monitoring. Um, if uh, if you're interested, we could. Maybe I could look that up and send that information to you. Yes, we want, want monitoring. We also want serum blood tests. Thank you. Thanks for joining us, Nancy. Let's see our next uh, comment here. Um, Lisa's asking uh, who's overseeing the dust monitoring? So DTSC will have oversight and will be present on site during at least some of the removal activities to ensure it's being conducted correctly. If there were any issues, we would correct them or be on site the entire time. Um, the consulting firm doing the work is reputable and during the supplemental site investigation, I was there all three days and all air monitoring protocols were followed at that time. I imagine, or I have no reason to believe that wouldn't be the case for the bra as well. Lisa, I see you have your hand up. Would you like to add on? Thank you. Yeah, I just have a, I would just like to know if the data from that monitoring is available and recorded for the public. And is there any kind of like um, citizen oversight of those monitoring systems? As the site is restricted access, typically you would not have somebody who's not certified to be on a site like that be on that site. So that's not typically something we would have. What about- but, 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 Do you mean but, the data? But Liz, but Liz the but data, data is part of- The, 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 the data, data is, is part of the- Yeah. yeah the data will the be report. available. Yeah, it, once that gets, well, if it's not reported yet in the SSI report, uh, those documents will be available for public review. So they'll be reviewed at what point in time? Because as you understand, as we all know, once the lead contamination and lead poisoning occurs, there's no undoing it. 
So I kind of would, I think it would be really important to know that information from a concerned citizen's point of view in real time. Is well, that, I mean, how, how, how quick is the turnaround on getting that information? You know, a day later, a couple hours later, six months later, you know. Um, this is why again, I understand. Well, when they when they excavate um, contaminated soils, the fence line monitoring, um, they do monitor in real time and they they stop activity and they, they stop excavation and adjust their activities accordingly if the uh, the monitors, you know, show that um, action levels for lead have been exceeded or, or even dust and the um, action yeah. levels for lead would be way below the, the dust action levels like the um, the ambient air quality standards for just dust alone without any contaminants. So you're saying that these monitors are assessing dust or lead or or is it and lead? Well, um, in this case, they're they're just um, well, I, Liz. Um, I, I understand that they they are monitoring for dust, but the dust level that they're monitoring for is way um, below any unsafe levels of lead. So if um, if there was lead in that soil, it, it would be at levels that are not. Um, what is it? I'm unmuted. Be careful. <laughs> Okay. Oops. So yeah, so we know that the concentration in, in uh, the concentrations in the dust are um, are not going to have lead levels that are going to be unsafe, basically. Then why are you monitoring it if you know that they won't have unsafe levels? What she's saying is um, our dust threshold is such that lead in that dust would be below that threshold. So our dust threshold is actually higher than the lead level threshold or lower than the lead level threshold. So any visible dust is too much dust for us coming off the site. So our air monitors would stop work because of dust before the lead levels became such that they would be unsafe. Thank you, Liz. I think it would be helpful, Mai, to hear um, from you what, um, you know, how much lead would you have to be exposed to over what length of time um, and what, what those models are. I think it would just help, you know, provide a bit of frame of reference in this conversation. Um, I'm, I'm not actually, what, I'm not understanding your question. Um, so yeah, going sorry, going back to Nancy's original question or concern about there being exposure, um, how much exposure you know would there have to be for um, th there to be a risk? Um, and I'm not probably not stating it correctly. I'm trying to. <laughs> um, yeah. Yeah. So, I just feel um, like we'd benefit from hearing a bit more information about lead exposure and yes, how much lead exposure. Okay. Um, so with um, soil lead from lead-based paints, um, the primary route of exposure would be ingestion so that um, somebody would have to come in direct contact with the lead contaminated soils and actually can um, in ingest um, some amount for, for it to affect their blood le lead levels actually. And my understanding is that would have to be daily over the course of a length of time, right? It would have to be. Um... Um, our models are pretty conservative. I think that um, you may be referring to our blood lead, um, our, our model to um, predict blood lead, lead levels in children, zero to six years old. They'd have to ingest um, probably about 100 milligrams, which is about, um, an aspirin tablet or an M&M size amount of contaminated soil uh, over the course every day for seven days over the course of um, the six years. So this is a children zero to six years old. And so that's a very conservative model that's not uh, really representative of um, adult residents offsite. Uh, 
Um, and I see that Lisa has a chat. Um, it's a cumulative poison. No? Yes, yes. Um, lead does accumulate in the body. I'm trying to read your chat. I, I don't see. Lisa, go ahead. Yeah, you wanna um, okay, get see, muted? Yeah. Okay, it's an additive effect. So what I'm getting at is that any, so you can, you can state that the add addition of what the exposure might be, even though it might be very low from this excavation um, may not be the only contributing factor, but they may have also had exposures because they live right next to Route 80. They have exposures just from living in an area that's fairly older, so there's still a lot of lead in the local ground. I mean, it's, it's seen that it, it accumulates, and so any added effect is, is deleterious to a child since it accumulates. No? Well, that's true. Um, I don't see how the activities on site would um, would be significant for for their um, for their level of um, exposure. Do we have any other questions about um, the draft removal action work plan from anyone? Yeah, I guess I guess I just wanted to say that um, you know we're we're responsible for managing the lead. Um, the lead cleanup or the soil cleanup on on site, and um, there was a lot of different sources of lead, you know, that a person could be exposed to, and um, that we can't really control or or should be responsible for. Thank you, Mai. Um, any other questions or comments from anybody else or um, Liz or Jose, do you have anything else that you'd like to add? Uh, not from my end, no. I don't think so. Okay. Um, I'll just give um, folks another minute or so if, um, you have additional questions or comments that you'd like us to respond to? It looks like we did have a question. We just came in, yes. Um, uh, Deborah, um, so during the supplemental site investigation in June of 2020, one truckload of soil was removed from the site in the course of our investigation. Uh, we were trying to see what the extent of the contamination was in the area after the band in the area behind the band building after it had been removed and we had better access to that area. And we did uh, remove one truckload of soil at that time. Um, the community was noticed and we did have a meeting similar to this one, but less formal with um, concerned members prior to that removal as well. Great, thanks Liz. Okay, I'll just um, give it another minute to see if we have any other um, questions or comments from anyone. Uh, the district, I'm not sure what you mean. Do you mean um, a supplemental site investigation was conducted under DTSC oversight, so the district did not do that without us. We were there for that. To my knowledge, the district has not removed any contaminated soil without DTSC's oversight. Okay, thank you. I was just, um, can you guys hear me okay? Yes, yes. I can hear you. I, I was just, I was informed that, that the area that was contaminated, none of that dirt was disturbed by the district, that when they um, took down the band building, that that was not part of the contained area. So I just wanted to make that clear and understand that that is correct. That is correct. Uh, by, based on my observations too, I was out there before we broke ground during the supplemental site investigation and that area appeared undisturbed to me and it's 
pretty hard to appear undisturbed on a construction site if anything has been disturbed. So okay. there was definitely evidence that that soil had not been touched. Thank you. And the this queen sheeting was still in place with the rocks and such on top of it. I know it's not pretty, but it is an effective way to prevent dust from being generated by that soil. Okay, thank you. Sure. Right, thanks Liz. Um, yeah, thanks for the questions and the comments that we've heard so far. Um, we still do have through Wednesday, May 5th. Um, if we haven't heard from you, um, if you weren't able to attend this meeting and you're watching the recording, uh, we would love to hear from you um, and we will provide you with a written response. Um, please don't hesitate to reach out to Liz or I if you have any other uh, questions or concerns. Um, and if we can provide any other resources um, about um, the draft removal action work plan or if you have um, you know, questions about lead, um, you know, we've got our toxicologist who can provide uh, information. Um, and is there anything else you'd like to say, Jose or Liz, before we uh, adjourn the meeting this evening? I just thank everyone who uh, participated in the meeting. Uh, uh, we don't typically do uh, public meetings for RAWs, but uh, when there is community interest, uh, uh, we facilitate them and uh, and uh, <clears throat> uh, provide it to the public. Yes, so thank absolutely. You for, thank, thank you for attending. Yes, yes, thank you. Yeah, thank you. And, you know, we're willing to, um, you know, provide a, a small group briefing, um, you know, if requested, we're always open to that. So even, you know, after the comment period closes, you're, you know, always welcome to reach out to us and we're happy to share information. So thank you all for joining us this evening and uh, have a good night.